<laughs> yeah, you know, be be easy on me. Don't ask too many hard questions. So no philosophy. No, no. The big ones. We hate philosophy. <laughs> The testis is a organ designed primarily for the production of sperm. And it's a place where a single round cell, much like every other cell in the body, transforms into a flagellated unicellular organism that's designed to survive in a world outside the body. In the testis, sperm are made, and their architecture is shaped so that they can survive outside the body. They're really the only cell that we make in the human body that's designed for a life in an aqueous environment outside the body. And the really interesting thing about sperm production is that when sperm are made, they incorporate ancestral genes that have been selected over millions of years to allow sperm to function effectively inside the body. So all these ancestral genes for structural components of the tail, and the way the DNA is packaged, and the enzymes that allow the sperm to survive come really from an ancient world where unicellular life was surviving in an aqueous environment. And all these genes are now expressed through the memory of evolution inside the testis. So it's a, it's a place of magic in a way. Uh, because we're reaching back through generations into the early primitive state of unicellular life. So this is Catherine Rao King, my great-grandmother, who lived on the Iowa prairie in the late 1800s. She was a pioneer woman. Why is she doing it in the basement? Well, she is actually in transit. Uh, she was hanging for a while and her she needs a little repair. She needs some new backing. My earliest memory is a memory at about six months. Uh, it's a memory of being in a white bassinet, but looking out at the snow through a window and feeling the cold coming off of the window. That's the very earliest memory I have. And memory has always been very important to me. I've, I sort of come from a Mennonite background and have never, uh, you know, I've, I've tried to do things, live my life in such a way that my memory is preserved as best it can be because science is basically a discipline of assembling 
many, many facts across you know, different domains and then synthesizing them. So memory is really key to it all. So I don't drink and you know, I, I, I try and preserve what capacity I have for maintaining memory as best I can and you know, not try and do anything that uh, subverts or you know, alters my ability to retain information. Anyway, that first, uh, that first view of the world uh, was, well, it was, it was, the first impression was, of course, it had, there was a very maternal imprint of that event because also part of the memory is the memory of being laid in the bassinet by my mother to be able to observe the falling snow. The human genome holds the memory of unicellular life. And although we're, as, a, a, as an adult body, a multicellular organism comprised of complex tissues and different cell types, Contained in our DNA, contained in our genetic memory, we keep this ability to create a unicellular organism, just like the original unicellular organisms that floated in the primeval sea. Well, the very first microscopes were built in the 1600s, or the mid-1600s. Uh, a Dutchman named Anton von Leeuwenhoek was, built the first microscope and was the first person to look at uh, semen. And he published a paper in the 1660s in the proceedings of uh, the Royal Society, showing the first drawings of human sperm. The microscope was very crude, but he uh, got the tail right, and he got the head right, and he saw little uh, circular structures inside, inside the head. And it was the, that, it was the first observation in, you know, using the very first uh, microscope. We, ever since then, we've begun to get a, you know, a glimpse of how reproduction actually works. Uh, I had a pretty typical Midwestern upbringing. Uh, Dubuque was a river town along the Mississippi River. I spent my school year uh, in this town. It was a town of about 60,000 people. Uh, my mother was an English teacher. My father was in banking. Uh, I lived on the river uh, in some of my spare time, fishing, hunting. And then in the summers, I went to visit my grandparents on a farm, and I did the usual things a kid does on the farm, uh, you know, play with the farm animals, help with the harvest, uh, learn to drive a tractor, ride the horse. Uh, so I had a really an agricultural uh, upbringing. My father also loved to garden, and uh, we always, you know, produced our own food. So it was a... It was a, sort of a, I'd just call it a bucolic Midwestern uh, childhood. Well, my grandfather, when I was very, very young, uh, this is like three and four and five, uh, my grandfather was running a herd of about 100 sheep every year. And he would, uh, in, a, in a herd that size, there were always two or three black sheep that were born. And when you're small, you can identify the black sheep because they're different than the rest of the herd. And uh, you, I was assigned the black sheep, so I would feed the black sheep, and they were sort of they were mine. And at the end of the season, when the sheep went to slaughter, my grandfather would always send me a little check when that represented these black sheep that I cared for. So he was trying very hard to have me 
become a farmer and you know understand you know agriculture and the care of animals and animal husbandry and you know these sorts of things. Uh, what what farming okay. farming is very close gonna... to the earth. Farming is has a lot of biology involved. Uh, animal reproduction is of course very central to what's going on on a farm. So my my interest in reproductive matters and the study of you know reproductive biology as a discipline uh, clearly had roots in my agricultural childhood. I wonder why did you turn out to be a scientist and not a poet? But that's another issue. Well, I I was very interested in in poetry when I was in college, and uh, I went to a very small Iowa college, liberal arts college called Grinnell right, guys, College, you know? and uh, the first year I got there, uh, another student and I convinced the president that we needed to start a writers' workshop at Grinnell. And as part of the writer's workshop, we were bringing in different poets into the university. And a, one of the really impressionable events of that sequence was that a poet named Theodore Weiss came to the university and uh, gave some readings. And then he and I met afterwards. And in a very personal conversation, he said to me, if I had to do it all over again, I would have poetry be my avocation and I would study science because there's so much knowledge being generated in science. There's so much depth and granularity there. So I, you know, I took his words to heart and a few months later I applied to Stanford for their summer program in marine algae, and I got luckily admitted to Stanford for the summer. And I went to the marine biology station in Pacific Grove, and there uh, started my first real serious study of you know, systematics and, and classification of plants. There's clearly a turning point in my uh, you know, education where Somebody had a really major influence on my thinking, and it was a poet. Yeah, in my, my first real connection with sperm biology began about 19, it began the summer of 1970 when, this was an era when vasectomy surgery was really taking off and people were wondering whether vasectomy was safe. And it got started because the immunologists began to recognize that sperm were foreign substances. In other words, one way to think about it is that sperm does not begin to be produced until puberty. And this is long after the time when the immune system begins to understand what's really self and what's not self. Sperm are foreign to a woman's body and are treated as unwanted invaders. Her immune system is triggered to kill them. Once they enter the cervix, they are in a labyrinth of dead ends. Perfect for an ambush.
white blood cells attack the sperm from all directions. By the time any survivors reached the safety of a fallopian tube, of the original 250 million, there could be as so few as 20. It began to be clear that if sperm were taken and injected, say, back into the arm of a person or in experimental models back into an animal, every animal made antibodies and responded the immune system responded to sperm in the same way they would to a foreign substance. So lots of the molecules in a sperm were seen as foreign. And that was because of this program, this genetic program that unfolds in the testis where all of these new molecules that are these ancestral molecules get synthesized. And many of them are seen by the body's immune system as being foreign because it's really, the immune system hasn't seen them before until sperm production starts. So there was a big, you know, era of inquiry that began uh, in, in the early 70s, really asking the question, what is the consequence of this immune response uh, to sperm uh, in the vasectomy patients, hoping that there were no you know, negative consequences. And people were concerned about things like atherosclerosis. And so the work really was uh, uh, focused on dissecting both the nature of the immune response to sperm and the nature of the molecules that were evoking that immune response. And I spent, you know, 20 years uh, dissecting different parts of this pathway, trying to understand uh, what was really immunogenic about the sperm. Uh, at a molecular level. That you that, say you, you say that the unique architecture of the of the of the gene is responsible for that mutagenic property, which is what you just explained. Right? Yeah. So. <clears throat> so. The program that goes on in the testis is the expression of genes for different parts of the sperm architecture. There are genes that are unique to the flagellum of the sperm, and these genes harken back to genes that are found in cyanobacteria, all the way back to the earliest primitive organisms. There are genes that are in the membrane of the, of the sperm that harken back to genes found in bacteria. In fact, these, the, the, the gene products, the proteins that are, that are encoded by these genes are not like the same molecules in the rest of the body. In fact, they're totally different and they're, they have specific functions. A uh, good example of this is the, the carb carbonate sensitive ad adenylate cyclase, which is only found in sperm not in any of the other cells in the body, but its, its nearest relative is this gene in, in blue-green algae. So there are lots of examples like this. And uh, what, what made the sperm immunogenic is what also makes the sperm unique. That is to say, it's these, these unique ancestral molecules that are being you know, forming this architecture of the sperm that makes them immunogenic to the body. So, you know, we, we began uh, sort of cataloging these and, and cloning them and trying to understand where in the sperm they lay and why, why they were, uh, not only why they were immunogenic, but uh, what part of the architecture they were in and how did they function in, in fertility? You know, fundamental questions like that. And growing out of that basic interest in what was really unique about the sperm uh, came this idea of signature molecules, that there, were, that there were molecules that were only found in sperm and not found anywhere else in the body, that these molecules could be uh, biomarkers or could be signatures of sperm, and that we could then 
use these molecules as ways to identify and quantify sperm. Explain very briefly, if you can, um, what it is a biomarker or a signature of the sperm. So, start by saying uh, the signature of the sperm of the biomarker is. Well, biomarkers are molecules that are unique to a specific type or lineage uh, of cell. And we've identified over the years a number of what we call biomarkers or signatures of sperm, molecules that can, when you measure them, can be absolutely pathognomonic or absolutely critical to identifying and characterizing the sperm cell. So we, we developed probes for these called monoclonal antibodies. We use these to structure assays, which then could be used to measure these molecules. And you know, through this process came up with uh, tests that could be applied to measure and detect sperm. And there were been a number of applications of this. For example, we've created uh, probes that are used uh, in forensic labs uh, called sperm paints. Uh, these are these are labeled antibodies that can be used in cases of sexual assault for the definitive identification of the location of sperm. And uh, you know, then we've also been able to use this these same kind of probes to create uh, diagnostic tests for uh, detecting sperm in cases of infertility. Pause, camera only. Basic scientists tinkering in their labs, trying to understand the fundamental nature of life, is a, is a discipline that's extremely rewarding in its own right and can lead to uh, not only you know, the exhilaration of discovery, but uh, very, very useful information. Stuart Howards is a clinician, and my relationship uh, with Stuart Howards uh, spanned many decades, and he brings a clinical perspective. So that clinical perspective is extremely important for a basic scientist because it begins to relate you know, what you're doing in a, in a molecular biology laboratory with the, the bedside and the patient. Uh, it was maybe about 1988 or 89 that Stewart said to me, you know, we've got these pregnancy tests for women's infertility that are now on the drugstore shelf. Uh, we've got tests that can measure uh, not only pregnancy but ovulation. But there's nothing there for men. And we need to have some gender equity in the fertility space, in the infertility space. So he, he, you know, he, he planted this idea uh, that if we could find biomarkers of sperm, we could develop uh, something very useful clinically. And uh, so the idea of uh, using signatures of sperm in a diagnostic assay uh, came from Professor Howard. There is a paradigm shift, as you described it, with the biomarker and the introduction of the biomarker because the efforts of the old Dutchman in the 17th century suddenly became, was rendered useless. We no longer need a microscope to detect the sperm. So can we go back to square number one, making that connection there, and then we'll jump into the sperm check? Well, the ability to identify biomarkers of sperm, these signature molecules in sperm, uh, leads to a diagnostic platform. You know, we, we pregnancy and ovulation tests are you know little kits that uh, can be used in a home context to me measure uh, measure hormones, and 
the idea of having an alternative way to measure sperm through an immunodiagnostic test really changes the paradigm. We don't, or we're, not, you know, from the time of Van Leeuwenhoek, uh, we've been dependent on the microscope to identify and count sperm. And now we are able to shift the paradigm into a plastic cassette that now can tell you information about sperm count. So uh, the, the molecular dissection of the sperm into its components and the development of immunological probes to measure these components allow, has allowed us to shift the paradigm away from the microscope into an into a immunodiagnostic test. Got the camera. Let me start recording. And here we go. Yeah, you know, I think the limit of the test you need to understand, and that is we're only uh, measuring one major parameter, and that is count. And there, you know, the thing that the microscope also does, and the thing the microscope in conjunction with other assays does, is it can measure things like motility and inflammation and genetic, you know, coupled with genetic testing, there's ability to look at, you know, problems in gene sequence and, you know, there's a whole other set of kinds of va variables here. So I think it's important not to put, not to overstate what the device in its current configuration does. So. But in, uh, you know, practical use, the advent of a device like this does give women, in the privacy of their own home, the ability to determine the most common question about fertility, and that is sperm numbers. And the device is, in fact, being used we know from the press and the reports, it is being used in a, some instances by women to determine fertility status of partners. So uh, it's, it's in a way, it is a, it is a way to give women more determination and more options and in, in, you know, more diagnostic options. Uh, male infertility, is traditionally underdiagnosed. When a couple's infertile, it's usually assumed to be a woman's problem. The woman's usually the first person to go into the clinic to have a workup, and yet 40% of the infertility is due to a problem with the man. And in 90% of those cases, there's something to do with sperm count involved. So the idea of creating a home test that would help in the help couples identify male factor infertility early is really a kind of women's health care advance because it reduces the unnecessary testing of women. And you know women are not just assumed to be at fault. Now this is a big issue uh, particularly in uh, countries where, you know, divorce is uh, easy and uh, barrenness is a major cause of divorce. So, you know, basically what I'm saying is about half the time male factor infertility is responsible for barrenness and one of the hopes of creating this device was that we would have a, something that could be used quickly and at home to identify male factor infertility, and it would put the, you know, the cause of the, the barrenness uh, e equally apportioned, uh, and in, you know, bringing more gender equity in uh, this this realm. So that's you know one of the ways the the device can impact uh, the management of infertility in in you know in, in a couple's lives. It's just get it identified early and get the man into the clinic to be evaluated. 
Yeah, I do. I would, I would take the case of women even further because, uh, forget divorce, but these two, my grandparents, I'm three generations back, two generations back, they, they would return wives in Poland because they couldn't bear children, not knowing that it could have been 40%, 50% of their fault, which we know yeah. now. All women that have been killed or, or, or abortions or, or, uh, or, uh, or, or you know, this, the humiliation. Even, even, and, and it, even with it, with our own cultural background, you take the case of masters. The, the, it's true. Masters was the uh, uh, masters and Johnson. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, 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 masters with his wife, he couldn't conceive, and and he knew he couldn't conceive, and he knew his guys were dead <laughs> out of the ejaculation, and he forced his wife to undergo numerous treatments and, and, and uh, I mean, for what purpose? And he's a scientist, and he's one of the most prominent scientists of the 20th century in, in, in this. Yeah, he was much more interested in the physio I would say the physiology of reproductive acts. I mean, I think that was really where his sort of sweet spot was. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the joy of sex became certainly a Bible for a, a whole generation looking at, uh, you know, looking at intercourse. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty appalled by this particular story because that shows that there wasn't much balance and understanding, uh, and it certainly it, it certainly says that he, he 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 was driven more by something other than science in understanding the dynamics in his in his marriage. Uh, I mean, this is this is gets at the root of this gets at the root of why the why we have created the device is that. Male infertility <clears throat> is underdiagnosed, and compliance on the part of men in taking responsibility for infertility has traditionally, uh, you know, not been uh, what it should be. So, you know, creating the device has been just a means to try and get get more uh, in-depth understanding in a in a home context to direct. Uh, to direct to direct them to to the clinic at, at the right time, and uh, the the patriarchal system that we all have grown up with uh, has a lot of these, uh, you know, lingering uh, maladaptive aspects to it, and they certainly are not in the interest of fertility and fecundity. I mean, when you really think about the female principle, it's really all about maintaining the propagation of species. And getting to fecundity, however you get there, is what evolution is all about. So, yeah. So that story about, you know, the masters is very unusual. I, I find it quite troubling, actually. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Well, I think that we're good for today. We don't want to push it. Okay. We wanted to keep it fun, no, we entertaining fun. for everybody. We're going to start selling tickets to the shows. And uh, we're actually selling tickets to the movie. What was that? Just say yeah. Yeah, why don't you get yeah, some for the uh, make uh, 1,000 prints and send to the press. Let's open that door a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Go behind it. I know you can't. But I want him in this. Oh, oh him? I have him here. <laughs> Just to get the set done. Okay? Can I do one from over there? Yeah. Oh, yeah.